in the last uh, day, we've seen the government announce half a billion dollars for an emissions technology partnership. Now, the pitch is that it will protect jobs in energy reliant businesses and create new ones in the low emission sector. How does that work? Well, Laura, this announcement today is part of a series of announcements by the government related to low emissions technology. Uh, last year, I chaired a panel that advised the government and they put out a low emissions technology statement uh, with an associated $1.9 billion dollars and earlier this week there was 540 billion dollars for hydrogen hubs and ccs technologies and this morning another 560 billion dollars for international partnerships the government is convinced and i personally agree with this that the solution to having a vibrant economy and reducing emissions is to invest in low emissions technologies that will ultimately replace the high emissions incumbents and so these announcements have been about exactly that it sounds like the government is trying to say to all the coal miners, you can keep your jobs as well, but we're going to increase the uh, jobs in the emerging technologies as well. Is there a point where they cross over and one takes over the other? So, Laura, that's an interesting perspective that you just put. Um, we could have the benefit over the next one or two decades of the world still continuing to purchase uh, our existing exports while we start to ramp up a whole new class of exports, for example, mm. clean hydrogen, which is a new form of energy resource, if you like. Uh, there's increasing demand for that around the world. It's still small. But by the 2030s, it should be very, very large. Mm. And so we should be benefiting from that effectively as a new export. We'll be benefiting from, I think, massively increased exports of critical minerals like lithium and cobalt um, and yeah. perhaps rare earths. Uh, there's interest from foreign purchases in Australian existing mining companies, mining iron ore and bauxite, to produce that iron ore and bauxite using effectively trucks, trains, mining equipment and ships that don't have any emissions at all, so that our products become a zero emissions input to their endpoint steel making and aluminium smelting. So there's a lot of increased opportunities mm. in the what I call the future economy, the new demand yeah. that is emerging around the world. And perhaps this is what we should have been concentrating on for the last 20 years, creating these uh, new industries that we could export to the rest of the world. Are we really front runners when it comes to hydrogen or are other countries already way ahead of us? Uh, another fair question. Uh, it's going to be very, very competitive. Uh, Saudi Arabia, Chile, many countries are interested in becoming exporters of hydrogen. But that's a good thing, not a bad thing. You don't really want to play into a market where there's not competition. It's probably not a vibrant market. So then you've got to say, do we have competitive advantages in that market? And we certainly do. Yeah. We Most of the hydrogen will be made by electrolysis. That's taking solar and wind or hydroelectricity and cracking water into mm. hydrogen and oxygen. Well, we had... We have lots of sunshine, lots of wind, lots of land. But very importantly, we have... A, extraordinary depth of expertise at pulling off large resource projects. So we're a trusted trading partner. Mm -hmm. And despite what you might think of as a fairly high salary structure, we've been able to export iron ore and other commodities for very competitive prices and build very strong positions. So yes, it will be competitive. That's a good thing. Uh, we will use what I see as our competitive advantages to really have a strong place in that big market. As a special advisor to the government, what is the long-term goal here? What will our energy system look like in, in 2050? So if you look at our energy system today, um, a lot of what we use is delivered in the form of electricity. But that electricity is generated from fossil fuels, natural gas and coal to a large extent. And we use fossil fuels uh, directly in heating buildings and creating steam for industry and um, for transport, of course, all the petrol that we use in our cars. By 2050, I would expect that all of the fossil fuels that we use for energy today will have been replaced by electricity and hydrogen made from that electricity. We can get to what I call the electric planet, where 
100% of our primary energy requirements come from clean electricity that will be reliable and most importantly, mm. will be inexpensive. So we will benefit, our future economy will benefit from inexpensive energy. There will be some fossil fuel usage in 2050 still for uh, chemical inputs to industrial processes and any emissions associated with that will have to be offset either by geo-sequestration mm. or bio-sequestration. Can we do it earlier? Is 2030 achievable? Uh, look, the international, the Australian energy system, the international energy system, it's a behemoth. It's just massive. Uh, I don't think it's possible to get to net zero by 2030, yeah. but we can and should go as fast as we can. It's not inconceivable <laughs> that we could get to net zero before 2050, sometime in the 2040s, yeah. but one does have to be realistic. It's a massive job that we have in front of us, but huge upside in terms of international markets and trade yeah. and a long-term uh, position where our economy is benefiting from low-cost electricity that happens to be clean. Just one final question, Alan Finkel. What about nuclear? Has that uh, passed us by or should it be part of the mix here in Australia given our natural resources? It, it, it's hard to say. So around the world, uh, large-scale nuclear has been uh, occupying a diminishing percentage of electricity generation, but there's a resurgence of interest in what's called small modular reactors mm. where safety and cost will be uh, both improved by a production line process and refinement of design. So we need to keep a, a watching eye on that, and I would hope that uh, we can build um, some technological capacities based on what we already have done through ANSTO, the, the National yeah. Nuclear Science and Technology Organization. So look, we, we have um, a, a legislative position where we don't consider nuclear at the moment yeah. and we don't need it at the moment, mm. but in principle, it could have a part in our long-term future. All right, one final, final one, Dr Finkel. We look at the rest of the world at the moment and ahead of this uh, climate summit on Zoom, because that is the new world order, uh, with the United States, uh, the UK. I mean, the UK is going to make legally binding a 78% emissions reduction by uh, 2035. The US looks more ambitious than us. The data can often be misleading. So where are we in terms of our ambition and achievement when you compare us to the rest of the world? So in terms of what we've achieved, I think we're doing very well. Um, as you heard earlier on the show, um, Australia's emissions reduction on our 2005 baseline is 19%, and that's well ahead of the OECD average, uh, ahead of probably half of the G20 countries when you uh, adjust them to the same 2005 baseline. If you take into account that we have if not the highest, probably the second highest rate of population growth in the advanced countries, um, what we've achieved on a per capita basis is really quite you know, quite impressive. It's, it's well over 30% reduction since 2005. Uh, we're on a roll. We're adopting solar and wind at a world leading pace. We are currently at the position where Australia has per capita, so per person, more solar capacity than any other country in the world. So we, we're advancing in the right direction. Um, the issue of targets is something that our elected political leaders uh, need to deal with, but I'm confident that our approach of concentrating on investing in low emissions technologies is the right approach, mm. no matter what our position is on targets. And I'm also confident that investors and other experts around the world recognise that. Dr Alan Finkel, appreciate your time as always. Thank you, Laura. Bye.